goes. And almost in every other verse, they changed at least half of the verse. Uh, it looks like, in some cases, just to, just to make a change in it. Just to change the words of it. And uh, so when you have a Bible that consistently is being altered, let's say every 20, 25 years, uh, if you teach children in a Sunday school class to memorize those verses, by the time they become grown adults, those verses, you can't, they, they don't apply anymore. The verses that they learned as children are not the same verses that their children in Sunday school class or whatever, that their children are going to learn and memorize. And so you change it with just about every new generation that comes along. Uh, Revelation chapter 10, turn your Bibles there, if you would please. Appreciate that. Frank Logston. Thank you. Frank Logston. I knew it was something like that. Yeah, look up uh, Dewey Lockman, Frank Logston. And um, in fact, if you go to YouTube, you can hear uh, one, of the, um, one of the talks given by uh, Frank Logston. And um, he just pleads with people and says, don't, don't, go, don't go there, don't do it. And I've talked to dozens of pastors uh, about this issue um, and all of them, here's what's funny. You can tell that somebody hasn't done their own homework, hasn't done their own investigation, hasn't done their own study. When everybody says the exact same thing. You know how like the news, like the local news will come out with a story and they'll sort of introduce the story and what the story is about. Then you find out that um, news, uh, TV news agencies all over the country are running that same story and they're saying the exact same thing at the beginning. You know what I'm talking about? It's like they're reading a script that was sent to them for them to read. They're all saying the exact same thing, okay? That means that they themselves did not look into this story to see how true it was or not. They were sent the story, Their, the head company of that news corporation told them, put this on the six o'clock news, read it exactly the way it is, okay? And so if I've asked one pastor and they've given me an answer, I could probably ask a hundred of them and they'll give me the same answer. Why do you use the New American Standard? And they all, Every one of them has told me, well, it's the most literal to the Greek and to the Hebrew. It's the most literal to the Greek. So I asked somebody else, why the, why the New American Standard? It's the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. What Bible do you use? New American Standard. It's the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. Same answer every single time. That's how I know they didn't, they didn't study this. They didn't look into this. They were just told this by somebody. They believed it and they moved on. All right, Revelation 10. Uh, let's see here, verse 9. I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter. Uh, we did talk about this a couple weeks ago, we didn't have class last Sunday. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now we have a parallel to this, and it's almost identical to this story here. But let me throw in something concerning verse 11, where the angel told him, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That uh, statement is being carried out and played out 
as we speak. The things that John saw from the moment uh, he heard the voice behind him when he's praying in the Spirit in Revelation chapter 1 all the way to this point now in Revelation chapter 10. Everything that John has seen, everything that John has heard, everything that John was told to write, all of that is being prophesied to many peoples. Um, I've been doing some, some research and I've got uh, these two books here. The one I've got at home is uh, William Tyndale's, that's the Geneva. The one I have at home is William Tyndale's uh, 1526 uh, New Testament Bible that he translated uh, from the original Greek. And uh, I have what's called a facsimile uh, of that. In other words, the, the, actual, uh, the actual book itself is in a museum and they scanned the pages and they made it into a book. And I, I have that at home. Uh, and I'll tell you this, uh, talking about uh, just how important the Bible is to the English language. Um, I found out over the weekend, I was doing my study on the, on the, uh, the uh, Tyndale Bible. Um, that Bible, there's only just like three copies that are intact from, that orig from those original printings that were done back then. One of them was sold to the British Library for over one million pounds. I don't know what one million pounds of what, but one million, whatever, however much a pound is right now, that's how much in dollars that they would have sold that book for, making it one of the most expensive books ever sold at auction. That's, that's the Word of God, people. That's our Bible. That's, that's, our, that's our Bible's ancestry. And that's how much high regard people have given uh, to the Bible. What was I going to say about John, this Bible here, John Wycliffe's? Oh, John Wycliffe's Bible. John didn't have the, the uh, Greek New Testament. Do you know why John Wycliffe, a Catholic priest, did not have a copy of the Greek New Testament? He was not deemed worthy enough to be able to look at the original Greek text. As a scholar, as a professor, as a priest with the Catholic Church, he was not deemed high enough, important enough, sitting on a high throne enough or whatever. He was not considered good enough to look at the original writing or the original language of the New Testament. They wouldn't let him have one. So he took the only thing that he had, which was the Latin Vulgate, and uh, he went to translating. He had a lot of help. He had a lot of his students, a lot of his assistants that aided him with it because some of the work continued on after he died. And of course, 44 years after John Wycliffe died, uh, the Pope held a trial of him, found him guilty of heresy, dug his body up, burnt the bones, and scattered the bones down into the river. And here we have uh, a book called the Apocalypse, which the word apocalypse means revelation, and it's the book of Revelation. All the way back in, what year was this? Uh, let's see here, 13... I don't, can't, can't, find the, can't find the age on it yet. And I think it goes back to the 1300s is when he had that, uh, when he translated that into English and so on. So anyway, again, uh, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Um, let's go to Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. That's where I want to start from. Ezekiel chapter 3, very, very similar story. When, when the angel had the book, John took the book from the angel's hand and he ate it. And it tasted like honey. 
When it got to his belly, it, it was bitter. And a very similar situation here with Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees uh, the chariot of God coming down from heaven. Uh, he sees the four living creatures that, are, that make up that chariot. And uh, the four wheels and the spirit of the living creature was in those wheels. So those wheels were alive too. And everything about that chariot was alive. That's what amazes me. Uh, but then anyway, um, a hand, if you look at verse 9 of chapter 2, when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. You know what's remarkable about that? The fact that it was written on both sides, within and without, is it matches the Ten Commandments. When Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, they're written on both sides. Why is that? Can't add anything to it. When you've got it, when you've got two tables of stone and you've covered the front and the back with writing, there's not enough room to add anything else to it. Plus, when you've written, carved all that into stone, there's no way to erase the letters out of it and add something later. And so that's the same thing with this roll here. It was written within and without, and there was uh, written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat, thou that, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. And this is uh, what I refer to as the method of transmission. In other words, how did the words, how did the exact words the, of God's word get into the minds, to the hearts of the men who wrote them down. How is it that Isaiah wrote down exactly to the word, to the letter, what God wanted him to write? How was it that Paul did it? How was it that Peter did it? Uh, how was it, again, how did John do it? How did Ezekiel do it? Well, this is the way Ezekiel did it. He, he saw the roll, it was spread out before him. He took it, he ate it. And then he went and he spoke those words, which is a lesson to what should be every preacher behind every pulpit in this world is that preachers ought to be men that study the word of God. My mother will tell you that the S word was a bad word around me. Study, I mean. I did not like to study. I do now. Uh, or I'll say this. There were things I didn't like to study, like math. But my dad brought home a complete set of the 1966 World Book Encyclopedias. And I would sit, and if I didn't like what, what was on TV that night, you know, that was back when you only had one TV. And it had five channels. Remember those days? And... Uh, yeah. And if I didn't like what was on TV, I'd grab one of those world books and I'd just flip through it and I'd just start reading stuff out of it. Uh, but anyway, uh, verse 2, So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Uh, then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee into the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech. Listen to this now. Uh, John is different in that John's writing uh, and what John has eaten uh, is going to go to all the nations, all the tongues, all the peoples. But Ezekiel's is different. And you'll find that as a, as a very similar pattern between the Old and the New Testament. What, what could not be done in the Old Testament was accomplished in the New Testament. Uh, I'll give you an example. When the serpent beguiled Eve and caused her to sin, when he tempted her with those three things, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, she failed that test. She failed that temptation. So did Adam, her husband. They both failed the temptation. 
and they gave in to the temptation. That was in the Old Testament. But when you get to the new Adam, the second Adam, which is Christ, the devil offers them basically this, the same deal. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Jesus succeeds in not allowing himself to be tempted to where he fails and sins. Uh, whereas Adam and Eve both failed. So in the Old Testament, where it couldn't be done, in the New Testament, it can be done and it is done. I'll give you another example. Uh, in the Old Testament, they would bring a, a bullock or a goat or a lamb of the first year. Bring that for a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. They would offer that yearly atonement for sins. That had to be done every year and, and done next year and the next year and the next year. However, we learn from the New Testament that the blood of bulls and goats and calves and everything else can never uh, atone for our sins. It can, our sins can never be forgiven with that. It must be the blood of the pure Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament, they had to keep offering the same sacrifice over and over and over again uh, for them to be forgiven. In the New Testament, Christ only has to die one time only. Amen? Which is what separates us from uh, Roman Catholicism or any other doctrine, similar doctrine, where they say that they must sacrifice Christ at every single mass. That is, uh, it, it is atrocious to me. It is abhorrent to me for them to believe that they are re-sacrificing, re-crucifying Christ all over again. They crucify to themselves Christ. In fact, uh, look at um, Hebrews chapter 6. I'll show you exactly what they're doing word for word. It angers me. I don't like, if you get to know me a little bit, you'll know I don't like, Bondage gospels. I do not like gospels that keep people in bondage. Hebrews 6, 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. They do that with every single mass. They crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And the shame belongs on those priests and that church and not Christ. All right, back in chapter 3. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. So verse 4, he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent, look at this, for thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. That's what I was getting at earlier. John, what John saw had to be translated into all these different uh, languages so that people could understand it in their own tongue. But Ezekiel is not going to people whose tongue he doesn't speak, whose language he doesn't know. He's not going to them. He's going to people of his own native tongue, Hebrew. And he's speaking to them. And so he said, verse 6, Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Think about that for a while. Now God's talking about his own people. He's talking about the Jews. And he said, you're, you're, not, you're not some uh, Babylonian guy, or you're not coming from Samaria, you're not coming down from Assyria. Or anything like that. You're not doing that and, and speaking some foreign language to these people. No, you're going to the people of your own language, your own kind, your own, your own sort of people. And he said, they're not going to listen to you. He said, if I would have sent you, I don't know, to, if I would have sent you to, uh, Athens or if I would have sent you to, uh, Rome or any other place, surely they would have listened to you. They would have hearkened to you. Verse 7, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent 
and hard hearted. Remember what we learned about the heart, the human heart. Uh, the human heart has in it the same kind of cells that our brain does. It has neurons in it. So when the Bible talks about us believing with our heart or speaking things from our heart or the things that are in our heart, uh, what is it the Bible teaches? If it's, if it's in our heart, is it eventually going to show up on the outside? Better believe it will. You can only hide stuff in your heart for so long. It's going to come out after a while. Uh, and these people are hard hearted. They will not listen. Verse 8. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. In other words, you're going to have two people button heads. The whole house of Israel and Ezekiel. And God said, Ezekiel, I've made your head harder than flint. You're going to be adamant. And we use that word now the same way. You're going to be adamant about what it is that you're preaching. You're not going to back down. You're not going to change. You're not going to reel it in and say, well, you know, let me put this in a, let me put this in a nicer way. Ezekiel, I've given you my words. I put them in your mouth. You're going to speak them and you're going to say them exactly the way I want you to say them. But I've also made uh, the Israelites, their, their minds and their hearts are also going to be adamant as well. And when you preach to them, it's going to be like preaching to a brick wall. They're not going to bend. They're not going to change. They're not going to turn away. They're not going to repent. It's, that's how it's going to be. How'd you like to be a pastor and be uh, assured of what you're supposed to do? But when you get there, you find out that the people just are not going to have it. And that's what he's that's what he's got going here. Let me finish this out real quick. Verse 10. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear within with thine ears. And he said, and go and get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord uh, from this place. And so um, next Sunday morning, hooray, we're now beyond Revelation 11. How long did that take us? Year and a half? Something like that for just chapter 10. All right. We're making some progress here. Real progress. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. Thank you, God, for uh, Lord, for making our heart adamant and sure about the gospel. Sure about what it is that we believe. Sure about what it is that we stand for. Father, I love people. I love sinners. I love people, Lord, that that don't know the truth. They haven't been told the truth. Those are the people, Lord, that I want to reach. Those are the people that I want to speak to. I want to preach to. I want to teach them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that uh, as you give me the words, Father, that we can change the minds and the hearts of people not just here, not just in this place, but literally all over the world. And Father, just we ask you to use us for that purpose, Lord, to, to change people's minds about what they think about your word and about what they think about Jesus, what they believe about the gospel. Help us, dear God, to change men's hearts, we pray in Jesus' name and amen.